And uh, I hope you really get a blessing out of the lesson today. We'll be in Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 19. And I want to start off my service today, my time today, with uh, with prayer and then a, a song. And the song I picked out for today, I sang just four days ago as my morning song that I always sing each day, Rock of Ages. But I did it because... It tells us about in this song about the law and well let me read one verse of this song to you and then we'll pray it says not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no rest it no could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone father Lord, I come to you this morning thanking you for the opportunity to be here again today. Lord, to be able to open your word, to be able to sing, to be able to pray, to be able, Lord, by your grace, and it will only be by your grace, your love, your mercy, to be a blessing to someone. I pray, Father, that you'll guide me in my words, my thoughts. And Lord, let what I teach today be pleasing to you. And let it reach the hearts of many. Father, we just thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name, bless everyone who listens. Whether now, as we do this, or tomorrow or a week from now, if they listen, bless them, Father. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Uh, if you have your Bible, and you will, turn to Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have it, uh, well, you can, uh, it's, on, it's on Facebook Live. You can read along with it later. You may be in your car going down the street. You may be doing most anything. And I'm just glad you're listening with us today. Galatians, Galatians is, is a book that, oh my, it's, it's, it's one of the most precious books in the world. The, the key verse of Galatians is, is, and I haven't said this, this is the seventh lesson, and I haven't even said it. The key verse of uh, Galatians is Galatians chapter 5. And verse 1, and let me read that to you because uh, it tells us what Paul is trying to teach us in this book of Galatians. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Free from what? Free from the law, free from sin. Uh, what is sin? Sin is the uh, transgression of the law. So if we transgress the law, we sin, and, and and the wages of sin is death. And so when it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which uh, with Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is the yoke of bondage? Well, it's the law. The law had us uh, prisoner. We were prisoners to the law. And there was nothing we could do about it. And there never would have been until Jesus. Jesus came. He fulfilled the law 100%, completely fulfilled it. Broke not even a single law in any way, in any, even a fraction of a way. He was the perfect man, and he did that for us. <coughs> it's hard to, sometimes to even understand how wonderful it is what Christ did for us. But I want to share something, share these verses with you today because it's so important and, and we really, really need to understand it. Now, you may wonder why all I've talked about for six weeks and now to be selling is law and grace. Uh, I tell you, every time I stand up here teaching the book of Galatians that you are no longer under the law. The law has no power under you if you're a Christian. And, and, and I tell you that it's not necessary for you to keep the law. And what I mean is, is that you don't have to write them down, put them in your pocket, carry them around with you, look at them every few minutes, make sure you haven't broken one of them. That's bondage. That's all that is. That is absolute bondage to the law. And, and that's not a joy-filled life. The, the Lord said, I, I come, and you may have life, and you may have it more abundantly. And the Bible teaches us that the joy of the Lord is our, is our strength. And so you can't have that and think for a moment that you have to constantly be worried about have I broken one of the laws. The Bible tells us, and I said we'd start in verse 19, but uh, in, in verse 18 it says, For if the inheritance be of the law... In other words, if what we have received from God, we receive because of the law, then it is no more a promise. In other words, if there's anything we could do, if we could keep the law well enough to receive forgiveness, to receive eternal life, then there would be no use of the law. We wouldn't need it at all. There would be no reason for it to even be here. For the in inheritance... The inheritance is the, the promise of God. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's eternal life. It's forgiveness of sin. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. Now, Jesus came as a promise. God promised Abraham that his seed, singular, his seed, would bless all the nations of the world. And, and that his seed would be like the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. And so if the inheritance were of the law, then it would be no longer a promise. The law was 400 and, I believe 420 years, I, I may not be right, well, I know it's 400 years, after God gave Abraham the promise of Christ, of a Savior. And so uh, 
If it's of the law, it's no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. That's the way God gave it to him. He didn't, and, and it was God's promise. It wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with Abraham. It, God didn't say, if you'll do this, 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 and this, I promise you I'll do this, 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 and this. No, God promised Abraham out of his own will that he would do this, and it does not depend on Abraham. Now, in verse 19, where we start today, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? In other words, if you can't be saved by the law, if you can't keep the law, if you can't please God with the law, then why have a law at all? Why, why even have it in the Bible? Why, why would we have to deal with it? It says, Wherefore then serveth the law? That's the question. And in the very next sentence, we have the answer. It says, wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions. Well, what is transgressions? Since we have the law, the Bible teaches us that sin is the transgression of the law. But wait a minute. What about before the law? Men were sinners. Why? Because when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the Bible teaches us clearly that by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin passed upon all men, in that all have sinned. In other words, you're not, you don't break the law, you don't become a sinner when you break the law. You break the law because you are a sinner. You don't have within yourself the power to keep God's law. You can't do it. Nobody ever has but Jesus. So it says it was added because of transgressions. Men were sinners. Like God, when God created, the, uh, when God sent the flood to destroy the earth, it said, and God looked down upon man, and every imagination of man's heart was evil continually. God destroyed man off the earth, except for uh, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, and then just as soon as they got back, I mean, Noah wasn't here very long at all, but he got drunk. The man's heart is wicked. And the law was given to reveal the wicked heart of man to man. God already knew. He didn't need to be, it didn't need to be revealed to God. It needed to be revealed to you and I. So he says it was added according to transgressions. Now, how long? For how long was it added? Till the seed should come to whom the promise uh, was made. In other words, who is the seed? The seed is Jesus Christ. How long was the law in force? It was in force until the seed come, and the seed was Jesus Christ. So when Jesus came into the world, lived that perfect life, fulfilled that law, died on the cross, was buried and rose again, we were in bondage to the law. But Jesus Christ, God's Son, has set us free from the law. It says, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Well, now, what does that mean? When God gave the law to Moses, we, we read the Old Testament and the picture we get is God standing on the mountain in front of Moses and he has these plates and he takes his finger and he writes the law on the tablets and gives them to Moses. This verse of scripture for the first time tells us there was a mediator. What's a mediator? A mediator is one that stands between two. To end this in a law court, whatever the case may be, the mediator is one that stands in the middle and handles what's going on and keeps peace between those two people. So here it says, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. In other words, God gave the law to the angels, and the angels gave the law to Moses. And Moses brought the law down to man 
And before Moses could even get to the bottom of the mountain for the law, man had already broke the law. The law says, Thou shalt have no uh, other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any eye, graven image, any idols. Thou shalt not bow down to them. And before Moses could get down off of Mount Sinai over the law, Aaron had already made a golden calf and they were dancing around naked and praying and bowing down to a golden calf. Now in verse 20 it says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. In other words, a mediator can stand between one person and a whole crowd. He, he can be a mediator of a, 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 a citizen of a city against the city itself. And so it says, uh, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. In other words, God is the mediator or, or the go-between for man. Between God, man, and the law. God stands between them. It says, in, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? Is, is the law against grace? Is the law against Jesus? This is what it says. God forbid. In other words, the law does not destroy the promise that God gave Abraham 400 years before the law. The law still stands today. It will, Jesus said, that not one jot nor one tenth of the law will ever cease until all be fulfilled. And, and as long as the world stands, the law will stand. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid if there had been a law given. If any one of the Ten Commandments, if the law, if there had been a law given uh, that, that could have given life verily, Righteousness should have been by the law. You see, God gave the law not to make us righteous, but to show us how un unrighteous and wicked we are. When we look at the law and see the law, Paul put it this way, I had not known lust had the, the law, if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul didn't realize his lust for whatever it was, power, money, prestige, whatever it was. We, we, we say lust and the first thing pops into our mind is a, a man lusting for a woman or a woman for a man. That's not what he's talking about here. Lust is your desire, your strong desire for anything that you would do anything to get because you desire it so strongly. <coughs> it says Verily righteousness, if there had been a law that could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture, verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. How many is all? If you look it up in the Greek, you'll find out that all means all. I mean, every single man, woman, boy, or girl born into this world don't become sinners at some point. They are born into this world already sinners. They don't have to do bad things to become sinners. They do bad things because they are born sinners. It says, but all scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So when we receive Christ, we, we can only receive him one way. We receive him by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and, and we quote it all the time. Most everybody, it's like John 3, 16. Everybody either knows John 3, 16 or Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, which any man should boast. And so here it tells us that uh, 
that uh, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So when we turn our eyes on Jesus, when we see Jesus as an individual, as a sinner, as one who needs to be saved, and we look toward Calvary and we see Jesus there on the cross dying for our sins, and we realize that he's taken our place. He is on that cross dying for me and for you, for every boy and girl, every sinner. He has taken your place. He has paid your price. It says, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise by faith, what is it? The promise is eternal life. He that believeth on he hath eternal life. And he that believeth not hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God abides on every lost man or woman. You say, well, I've not done anything wrong. I don't deserve God's wrath to abide on me. God's wrath abides on all lost men and women because he sent his son to die on the cross that they might have life and they reject him. They turn away from him. They will not have him. And it's kind of like you're going down the street with your son and you see someone step out in front of a car. They haven't seen it. And your son takes off running and holds out his hand and pushes that person out from in front of the car. And the car hits the sun and kills him. And the person that was pushed out of the way turns around and looks and says, well, I'll be dog. He didn't have to do that. I didn't ask him to do that. He didn't. Why did he do that? I mean, he don't need to be dead. I, you know, when we act like that toward God, I didn't ask Jesus to go to the cross. I didn't ask Jesus to die for me. I don't know him or me anything. I tell you right now, we all owe him a lot. He is the rock of ages. He did die for you and me. But before faith came, now listen to this. This is this verse 23, and it's very, very important. Listen to this. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. In other words, before Jesus came, before the law was fulfilled, before Jesus died for our sins, before we had another option, we were kept under the law. We were, we were under the power of the law, and the power of the law is sin and death. And he said, before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up, shut away from the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And he says, the faith which should afterward be revealed. In other words, up until the time of Jesus, every man was locked under the law. He had no choice. The law was God's law. And whether you accepted the law, whether you liked the law, whether you believed in the law, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, it does not matter. You were under the sentence of death because of the law. And we were shut up under the law unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that verse, Ephesians 2.89? It says this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, the faith, is not of yourself. It's the faith that Christ imparts to us that we can believe. The Bible teaches us plainly, no man cometh to the Father but by me. This is Jesus speaking. And then Jesus speaking again, he says, and no man cometh to me except the Spirit draw him. I heard a man one time stand up and say, when I got saved, God wasn't looking for me. I was looking for God. The Bible says that there's no man that seeketh that for God. No, not one. Not one. So this man needs to read his Bible and find out what God says about how he got saved. If he got saved. 
And I believe he did. But he's confused. God came seeking him, sent the Holy Spirit to draw him. Had the Holy Spirit not drawn him to Christ, he'd still be lost. But before faith came, we were shut up under the law, shut up unto the faith which should uh, afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law, listen to this, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. How much plainer can that be? Back when Paul wrote the book of Galatians in Rome and in Greece, there were multiplied millions of slaves. These slaves had all kinds of jobs and all kinds of education. And in a wealthy man's house, in the house of a, a uh, man who had authority, there would be slaves there that were highly educated. And, and when the man's son was born, he would assign a slave, an educated slave, to take care of that child. And as he would grow, they would uh, teach that child the father's business, teach that child how to take care of himself, how to take care of the business, teach him how to serve properly his father. And so here it says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That law, that slave would teach that child until at a point when the slave thought he's ready. And then he would bring the slave to the father. And when he brought the slave to the father, he would say, your son is ready to serve you. And the father would take the son and question him and, and, and get find out what he really knows and if he's really ready. And if he was, they would have what's called the toga virilius. That, that's a celebration. And the father would bring the son in and he would adopt him. It's his son, but he would adopt him as a full-grown son. And they would have a great celebration. And the son, would they would bring in shoes and put on his feet. One of the father's rings with, with, the, with the seal on it. They would bring a, a, a beautiful robe and put it on him. And the father would bring him out before all the people and say, this is my son. He's grown. He has every bit of authority that I have. When he speaks, I speak. You must take him the same way you take me. That's what happens here. Wherefore, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That young man was justified. He, his father said, he's brand new. He's never done anything wrong. He's my son. I've adopted him. He is just as I am. And so we ourselves, when the law brought us as a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, we were adopted into the family of God as full-grown sons of God. And now we are the sons of God. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. We are the sons of God. Does that mean we can go out and do anything we want to? Of course not. We honor our Father. We honor Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken up a boat in our heart and he directs our lives and shows us right from wrong and teaches us how to serve God properly. Verse 25, but after that faith has come, after we have believed in Christ, after we have seen Jesus and know who he is and received him as our personal Savior and have a personal relationship with him and are adopted into the family and therefore we are become his brother in the sense of being adopted. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. What is the schoolmaster? The law. The law had to bring us. Jesus had to receive us. The Father had to adopt us. And now that we have, what's happened? The Holy Spirit has sealed us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And nothing can break that seal. In, in the Old Testament, in, in the days of Christ, when, when they 
would seal a tomb or seal anything with Caesar seal. If you broke that seal, you died. The only one that had the right to break the seal was Caesar. It's the same with God. Nobody can break that seal. It's sealed by God. And so it says, but after it faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. If you receive Christ, you're a child of God. Nobody can take it from you. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not water baptism, spiritual baptism. If you have been baptized into Christ, if I take a, a brown paper bag and, and I take something and I put it in the bag, it's still there, it's still the same thing, but you can't see it. All you can see is the bag. I staple the bag and it's sealed in the bag. Then the only way you can get it out is turn the bag up. That's what's happened to us. We have been baptized into Christ. And what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing, not height nor depth, not even death can separate us from the love of Christ. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. We, we are in him and he is in us. And now the Bible says that we Put on Christ. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, by the uh, love of God. Be transformed into the image of Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We put on Christ. The world, when they see us, if we're living for the Lord, if we should, they see Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Back in those days, and I go there again, the Jews, when they would get up in the morning, not every one of them, maybe not every morning, but this was a common prayer among Jewish men. They'd wake up in the morning and they'd look up and they'd maybe hold their hands up, whatever, and they'd say, Oh, God. I am so glad that I was not born a slave. God, I'm so glad that I was not born a Gentile. God, I'm glad I wasn't born a woman. Oh, listen. That's what, that's what Paul's talking about. Listen to this again. Let me read it again. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all bond, bondman, slave, free, rich, poor, Roman, Greek, Jew, man, woman. We are all one in Christ Jesus. <coughs> and our last verse for today, we, we finish up chapter 3. Oh, I love this. Finish up chapter 3, verse 29. And if ye be Christ, if you're born again, if you belong to Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, Abraham had two seeds. He had the earthly seed, which was... Uh, Isaac, God told Abraham, if you take Isaac, your son, your only son, take him up on the mountain and, and there you, you offer him up to me. And then God stopped him because he obeyed and from Isaac came the 12 patriarchs and from the patriarchs came the nation of Israel and from the nation of Israel came Jesus. But he said, we're going to bless all the world, every nation, by this promise I've given you. So the promise was not just to, to Isaac. The promise was to all men everywhere. So there's an earthly people, Israel, and there's a heavenly people, the church. 
And if you're born again, you're one of Abraham's heavenly children. And you have all that that promise entails. And we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings today. We thank you, Lord, for your book, the Bible, for the verses that are therein, for the teachings.